We are in, uh, well, we're on the 50th class of the firstborn in relationship to uh, Abraham. <clears throat> and um, uh, we're in chapter 17. I would like to read, if I may, I would like to read uh, maybe all of, it's only 14 verses of chapter 17 again <clears throat> to refresh us. Uh, refresh our memory and the things that are going on and being said there. So this is Genesis 17, starting with verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, that's 99 years, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And we discuss perfect and it doesn't mean sinless perfection. It means maturity and Maybe we'll discuss some of what that means here in a minute. <clears throat> um, verse 2, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee <clears throat> in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore. Okay. So God has <clears throat> said, as for me, this is you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm saying I'm gonna do my part. We we discussed this before that that uh, covenantal relationships re uh, demand by the very nature of them <clears throat> that both parties fulfill their part, and um, so he has uh, the Lord, the Almighty God, has <clears throat> expressed his his part. As for me, this is what I'm going to do. And um, and then uh, verse uh, 10 <clears throat> starts talking about what their part is to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 10, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with any money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. All right. So God is, um, God, we, we discussed this. God has moved from merely saying, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I will do this, and I will do that. He said that all along, but now he's wanting covenantal relations, and he is wanting them <clears throat> based on a give and take, if you will, uh, a partnering into a, an agreement. Usually, I mean, in the old days, the way they used to do the covenant was they, they cut the covenant. This is historically sound, and they would cut their wrists at wrists and at a certain place, and they would hold them together, and they would share blood, and they would make a promise and a covenant between themselves. and And we have none of that mentioned in this story, but I'm just telling you historically, 
uh, many tribes and people used to do that. Um, and um, just, uh, I got a, um, an email uh, recently, or text, <clears throat> and so uh, I'm going to refer to that, but I'm not necessarily referring to the person that sent that. <clears throat> um, but the things that started rolling uh, from the Holy Spirit in relationship to that. And um, we notice that um, God is making his covenant. And he's saying, I will do this and I will do that. And, and as I was pondering what was said there and what is said here in the scriptures, I was reminded of God saying, you know, um, uh, when, he, when they came out of Egypt, you know, I am taking you to a land, a good land, land that flows with milk and honey. Um, I will give the land to you. In fact, he even one place said, I have given you the land. <clears throat> and, um, and they got to the border of the land and went in to spy out the land and saw that it was good. But they saw that there's going to be problems getting the land. They saw that there were giants in the land. They saw that there were giants, there was, there was two forms of giants in the land. There were evil giants and good giants. The good giants was the fruit. You remember the grape, the grapes that they carried back and had to carry just one thing with grapes on it between two men's shoulder on a, on a stick. <clears throat> um, even if God's giants are grapes and they are vicious warriors, God's giants are better than their giants. But that's... So they, you know, and of course uh, Joshua and Caleb are going, you know, they're, the people, the, the other guys that went in, the ten that went in with, the, with those two are griping and complaining and saying that we're scared and we're like grasshoppers and it's too hard and it's, I don't know that I can do this and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, Caleb stilled the people before the Lord and said, you know, let us go up at once. God has given it to us. It is a good land. And God didn't say there wouldn't be problems. He didn't, he didn't mention that, but clearly he was not looking at the problems. All right. My point in bringing that up is that God said, you know, there's a land. I want to take you there. I'm giving it to you. But something changed on their side of the thing when they got there and started complaining. And then God said, well, then you're not going to get the land. Um, because, uh, and of course, they were not going to enter in anyway. You know, they were going to go back out in the wilderness. And uh, so, so those to whom God had said, this is what I've got for you. This is for you. Um, they, they didn't follow up with their part. And, um, uh, and all he said was, you know, go in and possess the land everywhere you put your foot. I have given it to you. He didn't say everywhere you put your foot and beat up five giants or whatever. He said, just walk the land. Walk. That's what he said. Walk the whole land. And um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, so I, you know, I got to thinking about, I mean, I've, I've thought about that scenario many times before. And the thought being <clears throat> that God can say something to us in the Word of God, or God can say something to us. He can give us a word from the Lord. And um, that word from the Lord can sound so good. I've, I've, I've given you the land. I've, I'm, you know, it's already yours. It's da-da-da-da. And, um, and then, but, but there's this other part in that relationship, and that is, will we believe him and possess what he said. Now, one of the things we have to realize is when God speaks to us, he never speaks to us simply as an individual. He doesn't. We, we, we think that God sits up in heaven and he's sitting on a big throne and he's looking around at the earth and just looking at all these people and all that and he just sees a bunch of people and I think I'll bless this one and I think I'll do that or whatever. Um, but he says these things, these words or the scriptures to people that are 
in his family, as it were, that are born again, people that have the seed inside of them, people that have Jesus in there. And he's not just speaking to us. He's not just, um, you know, I mean, because now think about it. Anytime you've been at church and, and go up to the altar and somebody says, I have a word from the Lord for you and pray. And, you know, uh, uh, they say, you know, all these glorious things or whatever. Well, that's not just to you. You're just the vessel of, of the, the carrier. You're the carrier of the seed. And God, when he's saying that, is not just ignoring that his son, his firstborn, is on the inside of you. He, you know, I mean, that's kind of the way we look at it. Well, God showed up and he just spoke to me. But he's not, and, and we, we get that with Abraham because we know the seed's inside of him and God keeps, God keeps pointing him to the seed. And so, so we, um, uh, so Israel, maybe when they came out of Egypt, they're going, okay, we're going to get the land and it's going to be ours and God said it. And then they get, they go in the land, they see, they see that, well, you're going to have to be with me in the hard times too, you know. Um, but I said, I have given it to you. And if you don't believe it, and if, and why did they not enter in? Because of unbelief. I heard it roaring through the halls of your homes. Um, that um, uh, because of unbelief, but, but unbelief uh, because they're looking at themselves. We are, you know, they, we are as grasshoppers compared to them. You're, you're looking at yourself. You're looking at yourself. Okay, that's your first mistake when you get a word from the Lord. You look at yourself and you think it all applies to you. Okay, and so, um, so you know, let's just run through a, a few scenarios. Um, and this is common. This may have some application to what I received or read today, but it is so common. So in a, many times when you hear somebody get a word, it's always positive. So someone says, thus saith the Lord, and they're talking directly to you, maybe laying hands on you, or you're standing in a prayer line and they're looking at you and your head's bowed and, you know, Thus saith the Lord, I, you know, I will use you mightily. I will da 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 da. I will do this and that with you, and um, uh, he's not going to do that apart from his seed. He's not going to do that apart from Christ. He's not. He's not seeing you apart from Christ. He, he's not. He's not seeing you apart from Christ. You're just, a, you're just a vessel and a dirt one at that, an earthen vessel. The treasure is, he knows what the, what the treasure is. He, he recognizes that in all of us while we're going, oh, you know, the Lord said that I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and uh, you know, has, has this ever happened to anyone <laughs> who's listening here, that you misinterpreted what he said. You, you heard it one way and you applied it in a whole nother way. <clears throat> and then, of course, it's not going to come to pass. The other thing that happened, well, let's just say a few more words about um, it'll never come to pass then. Uh, and, and so then we go, well, you know, God, God didn't answer the thing that he gave. He gave me a word and he didn't do it. Okay, so we start blaming God. All right, trust me. Anytime there's a problem, the last person you need to blame is God. Just a, this is a ministry hint. Scott, are you on here? I've given you ministry tips before. <laughs> this is a ministry tip. Do not blame God if something isn't working out or whatever. There's a really good chance that it's you. Okay, could I say there's a total possibility that it's you because God doesn't make mistakes. All right. Uh, now, may, again, maybe you misread that and maybe you applied it to something else because it wasn't specifically saying, well, when you get into this situation and this person that you haven't met yet comes along, then I will because he doesn't usually talk like that. So. 
the the other situation is is that we hear something because so most of the words that are given uh, not by the prophets but by the the prophets nowadays um, uh, they give it's all positive okay like there's nothing wrong with anybody in the church you know what um, and and so when they when you get that word and of course everybody so it, let's just say a visiting minister is visiting and let's say that they call their themselves uh, prophet George prophet George has come to town holy 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 we have a prophet among us in the service today which is sure better than you know you know what we got uh, and so we we go oh yeah I want to hear what they got to say well you know most of them nowadays do not want to be looked down on they want everybody to come call them back to their church and get another offering and all kind of stuff so they want to say all kind of positive stuff that'll make you go oh, I love that they need to, you need to come back to our church and all this kind of stuff uh, do you believe that's ever happened before and I'm not saying it's universal but I'm saying it's happened all right <clears throat> so you get this this glorious word from somebody you know that um, you are special or you are going to be great or you are going to be used more than all the brethren or whatever I don't know all that kind of stuff <clears throat> well one of the first things that happens is it goes to our head this voids it out immediately but it goes to our head and we go <gasps> even if we didn't say anything to anyone else you know, did we get that on recording? <laughs> you know, did we get that on tape? I need to listen to that over and over. Maybe invite a bunch of friends over and have them listen to it. You know, that I'm, I'm going to be great. Uh, you know, and, and I'm special. And because I'm so special, they need to know this beforehand. Um, and so we're, you know, we get full of ourselves. Oh my God, that derailed it then, right then and there. So now let's apply that to the scenario we're talking about coming out of Egypt. What if Israel's going, yeah, you know, we're getting close to the land. This is going to be good. Can you imagine them? Kadesh Barnea, before they enter into the land, they're all, yeah, we're here. This is what God promised. This is what it was all about all the time in the wilderness. When, when God would talk to us, he would say, and when you come to the land, then I will da 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 and all this kind of stuff. We're at the land, you know, and here we go. And they go in and then they see some giants and they go, oh, my God, we can't do this. This is horrible, you know. All right. You're, you're not great then. You're not special. You're not, you have voided out the whole thing by not bearing up your part of the covenant, which, believe it or not, it, that's what we're talking about right here in uh, Genesis 17. Uh, God is making a covenant with Abraham, with his seed, um, and, but he's saying... Now, this isn't just going to happen. Verse 10, this is my covenant, which you shall keep. So we're making a covenant. I, I thought it. I told you what it, my part will be. Here's your part, okay? Um, between you and me and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. There has to you remember that flesh that made you think you were something special because of that word you got? And I know that almost everybody here has probably experienced that on some level. I'm talking about here in this room. Oh, there's only one person in here right now. Um, and that, but, you know, we've, you know, we hear that word, our flesh rises, and the Lord, while he's talking, is going, that's the stuff that has to be cut off. He's going, there is, there is no need talking beyond this if you don't do this for a while. If you don't get into a position to be with me in this covenant. And, you know, well, okay, so um, 
so in Abraham's day and all the way up till, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, all of Israel, they would all get circumcised and they would do it because um, that was part of the covenant of God and that's what he required of them. Uh, they sort of missed it though. They thought that was the covenant instead of just the token of the sign of the covenant. And so they, their, their flesh continued to be flesh while they were circumcised and, and calling that the removal of the flesh that God wanted. So when Jesus comes, he goes, okay, well, you know what? I'll circumcise you by my own death. I'll bring you into death and I'll cut out your flesh and I'll put the old nature to death. And I will, I will put my, the father said, I will put my seed in you, my seed in you. And you will live before me in covenantal relationships based on the cross that that put away your flesh and you're supposed to believe that and based on the fact that I literally gave you the life that will fulfill it in you. That this is my covenant that I will make with them after those days. That little phrase there is the new covenant. I'll put them in a new heart. I'll put my spirit in them. It's all, it's all wrapped up in the reality of Christ and the reality of the cross. And, and uh, so, so, okay. So let's say that we're, <clears throat> we're, instead of being Abraham, we're walking, um, we're walking as a Christian. Okay. Nowadays we're walking as a Christian and we're going, okay, well, um, you know, the, the scripture says, that uh, he'll give me a new heart and a new, you know, spirit. And, and the scripture says that, um, that I'm born again and uh, that I'm a new creation. And the scripture says this and that and all of that. But then when we face the giants within us, the giant flesh <laughs> that was circumcised from us through the death of Christ, all flesh. Um, we are so slow to say now, you know, like, like, uh, see, we admire uh, Joshua and Caleb. We admire them. Oh my God, look what they did. Yeah, I'm, I'm Joshua. I'm Caleb. You know, in our minds, you know, there's that great thing. And that's not, that's not confined to one person, folks. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, we're fine until we face the giants that are really that that have been have been crucified and cut away but they're still alive in us if we don't join with him in the covenant the new covenant and enter into covenantal relations we just become a christian we don't enter into covenantal relations with him but he this Again, this is my, this is talking about the new covenant. This is my covenant I will make with them after the, those days, saith the Lord. I will, I will, I will. Um, and so instead of when we see the giants having a firm foundation in the cross and in the life of Christ and no other thought outside of that, like, like Joshua and Caleb, look, he's given us the land. These babies are coming down. We are well able to overcome this. Let's go forward in the Lord. Let's do this thing, you know, and everybody else is going, oh, and they start picking up stones and want to stone them or something, you know, because you're, you're not living in reality, Caleb. You, you don't seem to understand the real issues that I'm dealing with. You know, if you really was, you know, sensitive, you would be more understanding of my situation. Well, you know, if you had your eyes on the Christ and him crucified, you'd be more sensitive to God. Did he just say that? Oh my God. Can he say that? Yeah, I say it all the time. Um, there is meant to come a revelation of Christ that deals with all of that. It's the, the revelation doesn't deal with it in the sense that it 
fixes it. It reveals clearly to the depth of your being what has been done at Calvary by the seed, which seed is Christ. And, and it is, um, it is uh, settled. It is firm. It is unchangeable, except it's a covenant that we have to enter into in covenantal relations. And if we don't do that, then it's as if that's not true. Okay, so Israel gets to the edge of the land. We're fixing to go in. We're going to go in. So they go in and they take a few steps. and They go, oh, oh, this feels great, you know, and then they go a little further and they find some fruit. Oh, this is great. And then they see some giants and then they go, um, uh, we can't do this. We can't do it. I've got giants. You don't know. You don't understand, Randy. You don't have giants like I've got. I think we all had them there in all of our land, you know. Uh, I, I'm not bragging. I'm dead. They're dead. That's not bragging. The cross, the, the sword of the cross was swung mightily at me by the Holy Spirit. And I saw my flesh, me, fall to the ground, as it were, spiritually die. Or another picture that I had was I saw, I, I looked at the cross and I, instead of seeing Jesus there, all of a sudden I saw me, but I was in him, but I saw me and I went, oh my God, that's not just Jesus that died. I died and the spirit of God, the, the sword of the spirit smashed into my flesh. And the Word of God became spirit and truth, a sharp two-edged sword and dividing asunder. And I was able to really see it. I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't have much going for me, but I know that I have seen this from the Lord. And I also know that I'm not prideful over it because I, there's so much more of Jesus I need to see and want to see. And this was one of the beautiful things when the Lord appears to Abraham, when he appears to Abraham, oh my God, 17 year drought, he appears to Abraham and God says, as for me, my, you know, in other words, we're about to enter into covenantal relations now, before it was all me. Now it's your turn. It's going to be about walking from here on, not just faith in the things. Y'all remember we discussed that? That, that from, from Genesis 11 up to uh, right here in the first couple of verses, it was all about faith and a Abraham and Abraham having faith for all these things. But now God shows up and he says, all right, the faith thing will still be going on, but now it's about walking in that. You ever heard the little phrase, we walk by faith, not by sight? Well, we walk by faith and not by feelings too. And we walk by faith, not by giants either. And we walk by faith, not by uh, uh, our fears. We walk by faith, not based on our uh, many horrible experiences of rejection. We walk by faith, not by uh, anything else, but by that faith, but that faith that we've worked, been had worked into us from chapter 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 to 16. Now, God says, uh, you, you've believed it, but you hadn't walked in it. Now we're going to get into a relationship, a covenantal relationship where you've got a part. You have a part in this. Okay. And uh, it's not by works. You, you, want, you want proof of that? The book of James talks about the, you know, that, that it is by works, but he's not talking about works of the flesh but faith works, and faith works by love. And that is, 
the, the cross, the, the true death, the true, the true greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Well, we read that and we go, well, yeah, and Jesus did it. He's my friend. Uh, no. No, that's, there, there's no real one-sided friendships. There's only Jesus did his part. Yes. But I'm supposed to lay down my life for my friend Jesus. He called me his friend. Okay? Well, if you're my friend, I'm supposed to lay down my life for you just like you did for me. And this is the covenant, the new covenant. Okay? So, um, anyway, I really do get carried away on all this stuff. I just, I don't know. I just do. I want to I want to share something uh, another angle of this that I was thinking about, and um, and from this point on, you don't have to believe or listen or whatever uh, because it's it's just something that I've got rolling over in my mind. But I found it to be interesting, um, and uh, and and it's this thing of um, God relating with Abraham. And his way of relating. Now we'll get into this, and it's over in the next chapter, where God comes down, and you know he he changes Sarah's name, and then he's on his way. The three of them, the Trinity, are on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah to see you know that whole deal. <clears throat> but there's a statement that's made there um, that um, let's see. I don't even know. Yeah. This is just left over from my searching and I didn't take it off. Um, and and it, it's... Um, okay, it should be the next chapter here. Um, and this is verse 13, uh, 8, 18, 13. Uh, and the Lord said unto Abram, uh, let's see, let's not go to 13. Let's go to 14. Let's do 13 and 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Um, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. He said, nay, but thou didst laugh. All right. Laugh, cry, reject, uh, fear, back off, don't go through with it, don't be a covenant, don't be in covenant with God in the new covenant, don't be in covenant with God. Um, that, that's what she did. That's what she did. But then it says... Um, Verse 16, And the men rose up from thence and looked uh, toward Sodom. And Abram went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? So he's just had God, the Trinity, just faced Sarah, who's hi you know hiding in the back, listening. You know, She never showed up. She didn't come out and introduce herself or anything. She just stood back there and listened to a conversation that Abraham's having with God. It's like, well, you could do that. You could be Sarah. You could, you could just hide and, uh, you know, behind Skype and, and, listen, and listen, you know, to what I'm hearing from God, you know. But then when the, when the time comes, it says, you're going to have the seed, you go... Well, I, I, you know, you could laugh or you can go, well, I don't think I can. I, I got too many giants and they're, they're ugly and mean and they got swords and they got all kind of weapons I've never even heard of. Well, the weapons of his war, warfare are not carnal. It's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. All right. So he's, God's just had to deal with Sarah. And he's doing good things. He's saying, you know, he's changing her name and he's saying, you know, at a, the time appointed, the time of life, you're going to bring forth. We should go, oh my God, finally, yes, and I want you so much. 
she laughs at God, laughs at his statement. And then she, she lies about it. And then God said, no, no, you did laugh. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so they get up, you know, it's like, we fully expected that. So now we're going to walk a ways and we're going to walk with Abraham. Okay. Because he got in covenant relationship with me. You should have been with your husband, but you didn't. You should have been with the one that you're one with, but you didn't. So here's, so we, we proceed with that. Um, and the men, this verse 16 again, the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom and Abram went with them to bring them on the way. I don't want to be sharing all this early. We'll get to chapter 18 later, but it's just mwah, tasty, tasty, tasty. Uh, and the contrast is powerful, powerful between Sarah and Abraham and his relationship with God. And so, um, verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? I mean, you know, see, that's the Trinity. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? But he's asking the other two. Anyway, don't want to jump too much, too much here. Um, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, and then verse 19 is really where I was heading with this, and that is, for I know him. For I know him. So I got chills all over me right now. For I know him. I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Let's just stop right there. <clears throat> all right. First of all, the word... Uh, children there is not in the Hebrew. It's son. I know that he will command his son to keep the way of the Lord. Now remember, I, what I'm sharing with you right now, I'm not saying necessarily to believe this. <clears throat> it's just something I was mulling over and thinking that my, you know, because of covenantal relations, I think that this is, is um, apropos for what we're talking about here. Um, so he's, so the word there is, if you look it up in Strong's, it says it is a, uh, masculine noun. It's not plural. It's not children. And it's not children like new, neutral because they have that. Uh, it's masculine noun. And it is the regular word used for son when it's talking about Jesus as the son. And when it's talking about everyone who's a firstborn son. Okay, um, and beyond that, but it, but well, let me you know, let me give you an example in comparison in the Greek, and that is the New Testament prodigal son story. Okay, and so uh, the prodigal son is not a son uh, in the in the sense of the firstborn, but he becomes that, and God begins to refer to him as son, as this firstborn. Uh, and then when he addresses at the end of it, when he addresses the elder son that should have been the firstborn, he calls him, even though he says son, in the Greek, it's child. Well, that's, these are the words that are equivalent with that in the Hebrew language. That was the Greek language in the New Testament. All right. So it's talking about, first of all, the what, let's, just address it up to this point. For I know him that he will command his son. Okay. And then the word son, let's see what I got here. Um, okay. No. Okay. The word command comes, and I've got the, a strong thing here. Uh, to give a charge, to give a charge. Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, there's several ways to look at this. Number one, Abraham is the father, and he's going to um, give a charge to his son, 
Isaac, who represents the seed, you need to do right and follow the way of the Lord. Okay. But then I felt like the Spirit of God was kind of starting to show me a little bit of covenantal relationships in this because <clears throat> I saw that here we have a vessel and here it is not all just God that, that He gave us a mind, a will, and emotions. He gave us a, a heart and, that, and He gave us a new heart and that new heart can choose the Lord all the time, all the time, all the time. Okay, so in that vessel... Um, we have free will. Amen? Thank you. We have free will. We have that, and we have that of God. Uh, he, he, he gave it to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And He wanted them. What He desired would they would eat of the tree of life. They eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and, you know, the rest. You just look inside and you'll see the rest. <laughs> and so, um, so, um, so I'm looking at this and I'm going, what if this is that he's talking to Abraham, the one who is going to bear the seed? And, you know, I mean, I know it'll be inside of Sarah, but he's always referring to Abraham bearing that seed, it coming forth from his own loins. The seed, actually, is already in him before it's in Sarah. Okay, so he's got the seed in him. So we have the seed in us. And, um, and so we, maybe we think because I've got Jesus in me, he's just going to do everything. And I'm just kind of a robot and he's just going to, you know, and so, and, and why isn't this working for me? You know, the other robots at New Creation Fellowship seem to always follow Jesus, but I'm not. Doing, well, because we're not robots. And because we're supposed to give charge to the seed that you are going to be Lord in me. You're going to be life in me. You're going to be the crucified in me. I'm giving you charge that this, according to my will, my free will, given of me of God, that I want you. I choose you. I want you to take over. I don't want you to just take charge. I want you to take over and I want it to be your life. And I'm giving this charge all the way through that I may guide my son into the ways of the Lord. So that he's got, so that he can do. Because he's not going to violate your will either. Right? He's, he gave you free will. He, he's not going to violate it. <clears throat> and... Um, and so, uh, so anyway, this is the way I saw it. And then I saw it, well, what if this is really, truly a big, huge part of covenantal relationships with him, of us entering into that together, is that we, you know, I, okay, so I think of Jesus. And, and he's, uh, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying. And he prays, Father, uh, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Okay, so then he gets up, checks on the guys. They're sleeping. Wakes them up. Hey, we got important stuff going on here. Of course, they go back to sleep, but he, he comes back and he goes, Father, if it be possible, let this cup be. But again, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. My will, I have free will, and I, since it is my will, and it's my free will, I choose to use my will to say not my will, but your will be done in me. Goes back, checks on the dudes, sleeping again, sleep on. All right, comes back the third time. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. All right. So, uh, what do we see in there? I mean, we're, we're seeing that Jesus is a man, that Jesus is in the throes of this, that it's all very real, that it's not, he's not walking going, everything's wonderful. You know, he's going, this is hard. You know, um, but, but then 
he says, not my will. Let's do this. You know, after the third time, it's like, let's do this. You know, let's do it. All right. So there's, there's, I'm, I'm trying to use that as kind of an example of us and of Abraham and of uh, being able to use our will, uh, not just because uh, so many people are passive and the enemy can just run them ragged because they're so passive. They don't, they don't hardly use their will. Well, we're supposed to, but you can use your will to say, not my will, but thine be done. But if you do that, then you're saying, I'm in covenant with you because I'm going to go to the cross. That's what, when Jesus said it, that was, you know, it wasn't, you know, okay, well, I would really have, rather have strawberry ice cream, but you want chocolate. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'll go with chocolate. No, this is the cross. This is, to say that is to embrace that cross and is to embrace that Christ and to embrace that life and to embrace that way and to be guided in the the way of God the ways of God um, and and um, besides uh, the thought came to me too we said Abraham will guide his children he don't have he don't have children he's got one son I mean yeah there's Ishmael but in God's mind, there's one son. And that, even though Ishmael was born first, this is the firstborn. This is the one son. Take now thy son, thine only son. Genesis 22. Uh, that's, that's God's view, folks. So he's not talking about guiding your family in that sense, not with that first word there uh, of children, because that's just son. And so... This is, this is the relationship that he's trying to bring Abraham into um, uh, when he starts <clears throat> spelling out um, this, uh, this covenant, you know. I mean, like I said, it had been 13 years. God appears. I am Almighty God. As for me, my covenant is with you, and this is my part of it. And he spells it out all the way to verse 10. Uh, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and then he says, but, but he did say pretty quickly there, uh, um, uh, walk before me and be thou perfect. And we think, again, we think, this, we think that it's sinless perfection, but then we say, well, it's maturity. Well, everybody defines that differently. And everyone picks a definition that fits them that they are that, that they fulfill that. <clears throat> I think, and again, don't go by what I say. But if the Holy Spirit bears witness with any of this, go with it. But if not, just say, Randy's an idiot, because I am, apart from the Holy Spirit. I think... What he means when he says perfection, and especially in all the places that he says it in relationship to in his heart, covenant, because we may not recognize that he's still in covenant, but now it's new covenant, and he still thinks like that, and he's still waiting for us to do. Anyway, um, is that um, it is coming into a mature relationship as to what he wants. And, the, and, and our part as to what he wants. And what he wants, folks, and, you know, I don't have time to go into the New Testament and just show you the covenantal relationships in the book of Romans uh, and how it is clear cut there that the, that the relationship of this is for us to embrace our death with Christ and Christ as our life and therefore the that's the land that's the promised land and the giants were crucified with him and us to be mature enough to be able to stand on that in the midst of what did we talk about last night the the roar the roaring lion or or whatever anything that's trying to take you away from what is settled in the heart of god but again it's settled in his heart but if you don't if you get to the edge of the land, go in and then start talking about giants instead of God being bigger than that. And in our case, 
us being dead, so we're not even going to, we're not afraid of giants killing us. We're already dead at the, at the cross. Therefore, the giants need to be afraid because Christ is now my life. Okay, so, uh, I guess that's, <laughs> you know, people talking about during the coronavirus thing, <laughs> they're not getting much exercise. I think I get a lot of exercise during these times when I'm preaching. I don't know. I'm just hyped up. I just want the Lord, and I want you to get the Lord, and I want us to get the Lord, and I want us to be together, and I want to know Him, and I really want to know Him, and I want you to know Him, and then I want to have fellowship with you, because truly our fellowship will be with the Father and His Son, and it won't just be with you. It'll be flowing out from that, and that'll be eternal, and it won't just be fellowship and in a message that we all agree with. It will be the living Lamb of God seated on the throne of our hearts. And, and uh, as it were, I'll just say it like this, the, the most real crown Jesus ever had was the crown of thorns. I won't go any further than that, but that's the one that the Lord allowed put on him at the height of this is the example of my son. Not some glorious jeweled one. This right there, that's my son. That's him. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who seek you, that gather, that, Lord, yes, that, that face giants, that face terrible things. But, Father, we're, you know, our group is not the only people facing horrible, horrible circumstances. It is universal around the world that people have way worse even than us. And, and so, Father, we, we should be quick because of our covenantal relation with you that you have provided the seed and you have provided the, 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 the sword, the circumcision by the cross. And we can enter into that and therefore in so doing, in, in a real way, we are bonded to you. Bonded forever. Bonded. Father, I know that we will grow in this more and more, but Father, Father, it really shouldn't take us 20 years or 40 years in the wilderness to finally enter in, and yet not enter in, but drop before we go, get there. We want, we want you to use this virus thing or whatever is going on, physically, spirit, soul, and body, to break the back of our religious, carnal minds that settle before we reach the land and call it the land. Father, by, by the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and in the power of the Spirit of God, Father, I ask that you begin to deal with us deeply. I mean, whatever shaking we think we may be going through, we need something that will actually work. So, Father, yeah, some are probably thinking as I pray, don't include me in that prayer because I want that cup to pass from me. But Father, you know what your, your plan is and what your heart is. And I ask you to move according to that, what's in you, not what's in my prayer. What's in you for your son. I trust you with the results of that spirit, soul, and body. I thank you that we could pray and we could not just hear, but we can pray according to your heart. And we can lay it with you. We can leave it with you. And we can wait upon you to bring it about to the glory of your seed, your son. In Jesus' name.
Amen.